I appreciate very much this opportunity to deliver this memorial talk named lecture. And um, I would especially, I would like to thank again, Dr. Don Prince for sponsoring this lecture. Thank you very much. Um, yesterday, uh, we enjoyed uh, Paul Quick's lecture in which he explained to us the behavior of the woke corporate bureaucracy, particularly he stressed that the corporate woke now downplay economic efficiency and consider free markets immoral. Remember, that's what, at least at the end of his lecture, I, I carried with me this notion. And absolutely correct. The task of my uh, talk is uh, to continue this conversation that Paul started yesterday. So I would like to uh, briefly uh, give you an outline of how um, a socialist thought collective developed since the time when Mises published his landmark book, 1922 book called Socialism. <clears throat> I want to argue that uh, this uh, woke mentality, this mindset that today informs the mentality of the uh, corporate people, CEOs, um, was in fact affected by uh, indirectly or directly sometimes by Marx and socialism that uh, was able to exercise a heavy influence on uh, a Western intellectual and cultural life. My story is essentially a paradoxical, um, a paradoxical story. The decline of classical uh, legacy Marxism, and at the same time, the expansion of Marxian thinking, Marxian mode of thinking into our uh, general uh, culture to all uh, people, progressive people, if they are called in the United States, in Europe, social democrats, not necessarily Marxist, of course, but who had been affected by this mindset that was very popular in uh, the mainstream, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Um, when I use the expression, the left or social thought collective, I talk about people, interests, sites and institutions that share similar gestalt. There's a German word gestalt. Yesterday, Paul told us, uh, this, uh, gave us this, uh, another German word, the zeitgeist. Remember, he, he talked about the spirit of the time. I'm going to give you another German word, gestalt. So the mindset, mindset of the people, that's, the, uh, that's what uh, socialist thought collective shares, not necessarily Marxist. Uh, first, I would like to emphasize that uh, the bedrock of socialism, even before Marxism, socialism became popular as the most influential brand of socialism. Socialism itself entered the modern history as a form of uh, secularized Christianity, okay? And in fact, in my book, which was mentioned here, I uh, have two chapters that explores this the how gradually out of Christianity in the wake of enlightenment, we have these first uh, semi-secularized sects that became known as socialist groups. And to illustrate my point, I want to give you this uh, a quote from Robert Owen, who was uh, one of the founding heads of early socialism. Everybody knows this name. In fact, it's the entry from Cyclopedia of Religious Denominations. 1853, there was a big answer on socialism written by Robert Owen, okay? See, if you read carefully this uh, quote, the authorities of the more civilized parts of the earth may immediately commence this new state of the true and superior existence of man, socialism, and may thus make the earth a terrestrial paradise inhabited by a new race of superior beings. And that to effect this glorious change in the character and conditions of the human race will now be a simple, straightforward matter of business, okay? In fact, this enter on socialism, as far as I remember, got stuck between two answers, one on Methodism and another one about shakers. So <laughs> that's how people viewed socialism at that time. I repeat, there was a gradual process of secularization, but for many in the 1830s, 1840s, and even 1850s, Socialism was kind of semi-religious um, apocalyptic um, movement. That's how they viewed it at this time. Of course, present-day 
left, they try to dismiss this lineage because they feel uncomfortable about it. And they, that is why many of them felt comfortable with uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, who came to the picture advertising themselves as true scientists of uh, society. Okay? And I will tell more about it. Um, so we see a strong element of faith, or religion, quote unquote, in early socialism and in socialism in general. Second point, uh, socialism, contain, especially Marxian brand of socialism, contained a strong scientific, quote unquote, component. I need to stress this, that Marx and socialism masqueraded as a hard science, the science of society. And it existed to scientific, scientifically explain the development of society from elementary forms in the human evolution to superior forms. Um, this gestalt, again, this mindset was, was shared by uh, by the end of the 19th century by many socialist sects, okay? When in the beginning of the 20th century, we have this great schism in the socialist movement. Again, interesting thing, great schism between social democrats and communists, 19, 1919, 1919, the great schism, division between social democrats and communists. Still, both factions of the creed shared the same Marxian mindset. That's what we need to keep in mind. <clears throat> Despite the denouncement of the Bolsheviks by Western social democrats, they still shared uh, similar Marx Marxist notions. What were these notions at that time? At that time, I repeat, not now, at that time. It's a blind faith in nationalization, socialization. It's a, a belief in a faith in plan, centralized planning economy, okay? Various degrees. They argued about the degrees of the centralized planning, degrees of nationalization. But essentially, they agreed the, the, about the final destination. We need to uh, go toward a total nationalization. That was the mindset of many people at that time. For example, such socialist leaders as Karl Kautsky, who was a social democrat, he denounced the Bolsheviks as terrorists in 1919. Still, shared social engineering mentality and mobilization approaches to society. And he embraced so-called war socialism that emerged during the war because war amplified this notions of nationalization. So we need to nationalize economy in order for economy to be efficient. See, that was the faith in efficiency. <clears throat> or uh, not necessarily social democrats and communists believed uh, in these things. Take, for example, Rex Tugwell, who became an influential member of FDR New Deal. In 1927, he visits uh, the Soviet Union with a group of fellow travelers, and he falls in love with what Bolsheviks were doing at that time. And I repeat, the year was still uh, 1927. Bolshevism was in its infancy. Still. He goes to the Soviet countryside and he sees that Bolsheviks establish experimental collective farms. I repeat, it's before the Stalin's collectivization. And uh, Tagwell noted with satisfaction that the Soviet countryside was turning into a gigantic communal field worked by tractors. He wrote that the Soviet agricultural machinery was moving around freely in a modern way without stumbling upon private fences. That's what he hates. In the United States, we have private fences, he said. So in the Soviet Union, they're eliminating private fences. <clears throat> in fact, this bias in favor of modern planning and nationalization, not hindered by private fences, might explain the silence of Western intellectual elites and cultural elites regarding the Stalin collectivization. Okay. You heard about... Uh, Notorious uh, Walter Durante, who received the Pulitzer Prize for objective, quote unquote, reports from the Soviet Union, and uh, we uh, are morally uh, condemning people like this. But the irony of the situation that people like Durante and Tagwell, they blindly believed it was not only progressive, it was humane to turn upside down the Russian countryside to drag these peasants into modern society. That was the reason why Tagwell and Durant approved Stalin's collectivization, 
because they believed it was done for the greater good and for the benefit of these peasants. Okay? So personally, they were not evil people. They didn't want to kill the peasants. But this mindset, gestalt, this, that drove the minds of people at that time from uh, San Francisco to Ural Mountains, this belief in centralized planning, nationalization, that it was good, progressive, that's the way of the future. So uh, was responsible for this horrible deeds. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to um, justify what Durante wrote, but we have to understand what drove these minds. Okay? So these peasants were a backward element. That's what Tagwell and Durante believed. And they should be resha reshaped. Their lives should be changed uh, for their own benefit. Okay? And it was a very symbolic, um, again, to uh, s s summarizing this mindset of people at that time, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. It was very symbolic that after his uh, visit to the Soviet Union, 1927, Rex Tagwell was coming back to the United States on a boat that was named Leviathan. That was the name of the boat. <laughs> yeah, I found it interesting. <clears throat> uh, I would like to stress again that uh, socialism, especially uh, in its uh, Marxian brand, in its Marxian version, was not simply a moral faith in the bright future, great future, heaven on earth. I want to stress that it was science. That's how it appeared to the people who pledged allegiance to Marx and socialism. It's a hard science, and if science says so, there's uh, we should do according to scientific prescriptions, because there was a scientific consensus in their minds, and we have to act upon this consensus, quote, unquote. <clears throat> So this marriage, this marriage of uh, science, again, I put this word in quotation marks, and religion, again, I want to put religion in quotation marks, because, uh, quotation marks, because essentially what uh, Marx and socialists did, they replaced God with state, okay? That's what they did. This marriage of science and religion produced this potent, potent political religion, potent political religion that uh, lured millions of people around the world, okay? If you read carefully uh, Mises' book, Socialism, you will see that, uh, you will notice that in chapter three of his book, Mises explores so-called chiliastic aspects in socialism. In this chapter, he addresses apocalyptic notions in the socialist creed. At the same time, in this chapter, he stresses how the people who began calling themselves socialists, socialists they gradually reinterpret, reinterpreted Christianity, which had been started in the 1820s by people like Robert Owen, whom I mentioned, and was finalized by Marx, Karl Marx, and Frederick Engels. Let me quote Mises in this case. Uh, curiously enough, it's this particular socialism, Marx and socialism, derived in this way from mystical ideas whose origin is lost in the darkness of history, which has called itself scientific socialism. It was an unusually clever trick on the part of the Marxists to call the Achilleastic teachings science. Such a step was bound to be effective in an age when people relied on nothing but science and rejected Metaphysics, unquote. So see, he already uh, noted this strange marriage of science and religion that made uh, Marx and socialism popular among millions of people in various countries, from Soviet Union to China and beyond. <clears throat> it's essential to remember that by the early 1900s, many, including those who did not necessarily belong to the um, a socialist fellowship. In fact, um, at first, uh, I wanted to um, use a different <coughs> subtitle for my talk. Okay? I wanted to call it 100 Years of the Socialist Fellowship, okay? just to let you know what we're talking about here. But I decided to stick to a Misian expression, Commonwealth. You know? Although in my mind, this expression, Commonwealth, uh, arouses these notions of civic unity, political unity. So I think the word fellowship will be a better way to describe uh, socialists, the scientific, quote unquote, uh, fellowship. <clears throat> uh, as you know, 
the historical uh, role of Mises was to demolish this uh, scientific aspect of socialism. So we talk a lot about the socialist calculation debate, which left in 1920s, 1930s, believed they won. So that's what the assumption that the left won the debate. Okay. But in reality, Mises debunked this concept about efficiency of socialism, that socialism would bring the plenty. Because the major notion of socialism was that scientifically managed in society, socialism, Marx and socialism, would be able to provide uh, material growth, efficiency, plenty. Okay? And in fact, um, Frederick Engels, one of the uh, chief founders of uh, Marxism, wrote a special brochure called Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, 1883. It's a small brochure that became like a catechism for all members of uh, the Socialist Fellowship. It, by the way, it was not Das Kapital that was popular among the members of this um, uh, fellowship, because Das Kapital was used as a token. To, uh, uh, they put it on a shelf to show that the sense of uh, belonging. I belong to the fellowships, but hardly anybody read it. Okay? You know that uh, the first translation of Das Kapital was, was done in Russian in um, 1871, and censorship, Russian censorship, Tsar censorship, allowed this book to be published because they believed it was uh, written in such dense language nobody could read it. You know? <laughs> So it was Engels' brochure uh, uh, called uh, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, that became the major catechism for all members of the Socialist Fellowship. But look, the title of this book, the title of the book uh, was to let people know that we, Marx and Engels, came to provide you the real science of society, because other folks who came before us, like Robert Owen, Henri Saint-Simon, they were utopians. They didn't know how to do science, so we are hard scientists, okay? So we invented this real, true scientist. And in fact, the message was very simple, that there was no social science uh, beyond Marxism. That was the only, the only <laughs> social science. So that's a totalitarian aspect of this science. In fact, Lenin, Lenin later uh, uttered the famous phrase that Marxism is omnipotent because it's true. It's a quotation, okay? <laughs> so the only science, so no other science, social science is allowed. And uh, to the present day, you can see uh, these words chiseled in, uh, uh, Karl Marx, uh, on the Karl Marx monument that you can see in the downtown of Moscow. So the Marxism is omnipotent because it, it's true. It's a claim in total knowledge. So the role of Mises was to debunk this notion completely. So science was totally debunked. What happened next? <clears throat> what we see next is very interesting. So socialists, Marx and socialists, begin to retreat. Um, somewhere in 1960s, 1970s, they started to embrace, su embrace such things like market socialism. Okay? Uh, Oscar Lange, who was one of the major proponents of market socialism. Ironically, uh, Lange was um, debunked by many on the left in 1930s as a traitor who offered some kind of corrupted bourgeois teaching that shouldn't be accepted by the leftists. But in the 1960s, 1970s, when efficiency, scientific efficiency of socialism was losing, okay, after repeated cycles of failures, such people like Lange became very popular. Different brands of uh, market socialism were embraced on the left. Okay? So it's, I see it as a strategy of uh, an ideological retreat. In a similar manner, by the 1980s, 1990s, Keynesianism, which many on the left had considered a taboo. So Keynesianism, it was a bourgeois thing. So you cannot do Keynesianism. It's what... Uh, Capitalists tried to screw us by using Keynesianism. But ironically, in 1980s, 1990s, it was coming, becoming popular on the left, it was gaining popularity in mainstream socialism. In fact, uh, as early as the 1950s, in his book, Socialist Faith, see the title of the book, Socialist Faith, 
1951. Uh, one Norman Thomas, a former Presbyterian minister and the head of the American Socialist Party, stressed that for the true socialist, it was essential to embrace Keynes' ideas. But again, in 1951, uh, Norman Thomas was still viewed as a traitor by offering this, but later it became the mainstream. To Norman Thomas, the value of the Keynesian way uh, for socialists was twofold. First, without completely banishing the market system, Keynes showed how to gradually break away from the laissez affair system. Okay? Second, as Thomas enlightened us, Keynes rationally and scientifically, again, I put this word in quotation marks, of course, Norman used it without quotation marks. Keynes scientifically explained why a state might be the primary force to regulate economy as well as to guide investments and spendings. <clears throat> in a similar way, in our days, the left completely embraced and weaponized the science of climate change because they were losing their Marxist side, Marxist um, essence. They could not use uh, the Marxian science, so to speak. That, uh, the, um, their signature approach about the efficiency of Marx and socialism by the 1970s failed. Okay? So they don't give up yet on science. That is why we see market socialism was embraced for a while. Then Keynesianism was and still is embraced by the mainstream left. In a similar manner, in our days, the left completely embraced and weaponized the science, quote unquote, of climate change because it had opened the opportunity to infringe or curtail economic liberty. The only difference here is that in the 1930s, the left argued that capitalism um, was not able to provide material wealth and plenty. That is why we have to squash capitalism. But right now, their argument goes like this. Because of, the, of capitalism, we have uh, global warming, so we have to squash capitalism because capitalism kills the planet. Okay? Science, science says so. There is scientific consensus about it. Um, since the 1960s, gradually on the left, the very notion of economic efficiency became a curse word. Okay? And it became very noticeable um, among, in the writings of so-called the new left. Okay? If you read the new leftist in the 1960s, you will see that it was not only assault on capitalism, but more and more, it was assault, assault on um, material plant, material growth. From being the goal of socialist movement, growth and efficiency became the objects of moral indignation. That's where it comes from, this moral indignation. On the left, we see uh, a lot of critique of so-called Victorian Marxism. So it was the old Marxism. We don't need to uh, talk too much about economics, okay? We don't need to talk about the working class because in the traditional Marxism, working class was considered the chosen people who were destined by history to destroy capitalism. That was the major notion in Marxism. In her uh, book, The New Left, an anti-industrial revolution, Ayn Rand and I give you this um, quote, in her bombastic way, writes, the old line Marxists used to claim that a single modern factory uh, could produce enough shoes to provide for the whole population of the world and that nothing but capitalism prevented it. When they discovered the facts of reality in the world, they declared that going barefoot is superior to wearing shoes. Okay. So, that's how efficiency was going away, you know, and material growth was going away. Uh, in fact, in fact, in his socialism book, again, I, I apologize that I give you a lot of quotes today, but I, I cannot do without this, I guess. In his socialism uh, book, Mises had already anticipated this trend. When the myth of socialism efficiency would subside, he stressed, the left would be shifting to the attacks on... Uh, on the material growth, quote, I quote Mises, we may detect a gradual change in their socialist attitude. As the uneconomic nature of socialistic production becomes apparent, 
socialists are beginning to transform their views on the desirability of a more abundant satisfaction of human wants. Many of them are even beginning, very important, many of them are even beginning to show some sympathy with writers who praise the Middle Ages and look with contempt on the riches which capitalism adds to the means of existence, unquote. Why did I interrupt my quotation? I said, very important that uh, the words of Mises, I want to underline that some of them started to praise Middle Ages and old times because, and I'm going to expand on this, one of the uh, major messages of the mainstream left right now, it's um, a so-called uh, nostalgia for mud, I call it nostalgia for mud. It's um, anti-growth, anti-efficiency, this moral message, okay? And that's what we have in the left mainstream right now. <clears throat> At the present time, this neo-primitivist nostalgia for mud became a powerful narrative in the entire left thought collective. This neo-primitivist notion, which is ideologically linked to the uh, climate uh, or green agenda, climate agenda, is focused on the romantic glorification of non-Western societies. See, that's one of the bedrocks of so-called multiculturalist ideology that dominates today our society. It's glorification of the non-Western societies and bashing the Western civilization, okay? <clears throat> For example, Bernie Sanders, one of the major spokespeople for democratic socialism in the United States, invoked that narrative uh, when he stressed the significance of Native American tribal wisdom for a great reset of our society according to the climate change agenda. Another random example, you can find the hundreds or thousands of these examples. I just picked up uh, two random examples. A UK communist activist, Mike McKean Waite, a member of the British Communist Party still exists, this organization, who shares the same approach with Bernie Sanders, pointed out that in their projects about the better forms of life in future, the left should focus on learning from indigenous non-Western people. So they should learn collective ethics, ecological wisdom from these people, okay? So by the 1990s, traditional Marx and socialism with its class-based ethics and the stress on economic plenty, efficiency, retreated and became marginalized. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the partial degeneration of communism in China, a retreat of socialism in India, Latin America, France, UK, many optimistically talked about the death of socialism. And they were seen in Requiem for Karl Marx. What many didn't see at that time, that the victory in the Cold War was the victory of democratic socialism over its uh, wild and mad brother called communist, communism. Second, uh, Marx and the Marxian brand of socialism indeed retreated, as I said, was marginalized. But at the same time, being the most popular brand of socialism, Marxism le uh, left a powerful intellectual residue in our society that affected all uh, works of our life. So that's this paradoxical situation. So the legacy Marxism was dying at the same time we have expansion of the Marxian mode of thinking into our wider culture, okay? <clears throat> Let me again quote Mises, who noted as early as the 1920s, detecting this trend, so he already anticipated this trend. Um, the influence of Marxist ideas extend far beyond the circle of orthodox disciples. And then he writes about some scholars who by means uh, uh, cannot be considered Marxist, but still prophesize the Marxist notions, Marxist arguments, because it was embedded in the, uh, our intellectual culture. A veteran new left activist and sociologist scholar for some reason, they're uh, uh, among the leftists. They have so many sociologists. I don't know what's about this profession. It's just uh, almost 99% of sociologists, they're leftists. So uh, a veteran new left activist, Harold Bershadi, in his memoirs recently wrote with satisfaction that by 1980, Marxist literature became a staple reading 
not only in colleges, but also in uh, high schools. And I want to draw your attention that this guy, Bershadi, new leftist, he writes not about uh, European countries, he writes about the United States, where, as some early commentators tried to convince us, it did not happen here. Okay, it's a, in, in case, in fact, this last phrase, it didn't happen here. It's a title of a book by Seymour Lipset, another sociologist who wrote a book in 19, uh, 2001. It was called, it didn't happen here. So why socialism would not be possible in the United States? It did happen here in reality. In the French uh, language, they have a useful expression for what we're talking about here today. This expression is Marxism, Marxism, okay. Marxism means somewhat Marxist, tending toward, moving toward Marxism, and especially reasoning in the Marxian manner. And here I listed a bunch of uh, uh, memes, so I'm using this current usage, memes that came from Marxism and entered our popular usage, not only leftist usage, but to some extent even the mainstream usage. So it's Marxism, Marxism. Of course, the fact that this expression Marxism emerged in France, it's not accidental because in France, Marxism became deeply embedded in her intellectual culture. You know about this, right? Um, the example of such Marxism mindset is thinking about surrounding, surrounding society uh, in terms of abstract groups. There are oppressed groups and groups of oppressors, okay? That's this black and white, or literally or metaphorically, so to speak. Or uh, take, for example, uh, one of the most popular uh, memes I hear from my students, from other people. Uh, I read it, uh, a meme uh, in media, false consciousness. False, false consciousness. It comes from Marxism, directly from Marxism. For example, in old times, when um, uh, a worker aspired to have a middle-class lifestyle, to wear a three-piece suit, like watch on a chain, so he uh, could be frowned upon like a traitor to his class. So it was expected that he should become woke because socialist missionaries should come to him and explain to him that the true worker should strike, should um, go to uh, socialist um, uh, book clubs, read socialist literature, and wear uh, some kind of junky overalls instead of three-piece suit. You know, that was the assumption. So today, we have a similar notion among, among so-called uh, um, identity Marxists, or race Marxists, the, or cultural Marxists, if you wish, who try to, in the same manner, they try to enlighten um, uh, some women or some uh, so-called people of color. Uh, they try to educate them about how they should be the true representatives of their races. Okay? It directly comes from Marxism. <clears throat> this notion, by the way, about the false conscious, consciousness uh, already entered our mainstream political usage. I'm sure you remember how Joe Biden remarked to a black reporter who interviewed him during the last year presidential campaign, and I quote Biden in this case, if you have a problem figuring out whether you are for me or Trump, then you ain't black, unquote. So it's, uh, of course, I, I don't assume that Joe Biden is socialist, no way. But I'm talking about this um, Marxism usage that entered our mainstream culture and uh, became uh, accepted by uh, many segments of our society. Um, between the 1970s and 1990s, there was much pessimism and melancholia in the left thought collective in the wake of the Soviet collapse. As one progressive mentioned at that time, uh, there was a sense of classlessness. So they lost the class. They couldn't gamble anymore on the working class people, okay, who in their mind betrayed them because they started to enjoy a good, uh, uh, good living standards. They didn't want to go to barricades, okay. <laughs> Yet, by the new millennium, the mainstream left was able to refurbish themselves by gradually shifting their attention to new crisis areas, such as race, gender, culture, and personal life. Remember the slogan that became popular by the beginning of the 1970s, personal is political, personal is political. So everything should be politicized. 
This was, I, I'm not assuming that there was a cabal of some leftists who were thinking of what we're going to do, you know, how we're going to find another revolutionary force. It, it was happening spontaneously, gradually, okay? That's my point. This was a spontaneous strategy uh, of an ideological exit for the left who wanted to maintain their identity in the new changing world. And earlier Marxian blueprints provided the handy tools for that ideological shift. In fact, and I would like to stress this, in the left thought collective, they uh, call the shift the cultural turn. The cultural turn, it's very important. The point was to stress that we are moving away from classical legacy Marxism that was focused on economics and class, proletariat. Uh, by the way, if you don't know about it, to describe that shift, some writers on the left used the expression cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism. Ironically, many present day leftists insist that this expression had been invaded, uh, they call it Nazi label, hate symbol, hate exp hateful expression. Uh, leftists insisted that some right wing people had invented this expression. In the reality, the leftists themselves in 1970s, 1980s, they used this expression. Okay. So the woke movement, which currently suffocates our intellectual and cultural life, and the ideological education scheme that is called the critical race theory, CRT, represent the offshoots of that cultural turn, or cultural Marxism, if you wish. Okay. When the left cast aside the working class from the pedestal of the ultimate chosen people, who were expected to destroy capitalism, they began searching for a new revolutionary force. With the intellectual help of the Frankfurt School, British Cultural Studies, the New Left Review magazine, and the French think tank Kadadim, that united thousands of former Marxists and Maoists, they were finally located, they finally were able to locate new movers and, sh movers and shakers, so to speak. And they found these movers and shakers, the new revolutionary force, in the third world. And among the racial and gender minorities in the West. For example, in France, the major reference points for the mainstream left uh, was the third world and the Muslim minority. Okay? In the United States, for the left, the major reference uh, point or reference force or revolutionary class was the third world, of course, because national liberation movements and the black power movements or other uh, power movements, Hispanic power, Latin power, and so forth. Okay? So the shift from class to race and culture. Um, that's how the mainstream left um, replaced gradually class with the race, gender, and culture. And I repeat, it was not only Fra the Frankfurt School that was the major culprit here. It was more this um, English-speaking centers of uh, intellectual power, like British cultural studies, the New Left Review. They were more actually influential because if you read the works written by Frankfurt scholars, they're, they're hard to read, okay? But they were English-speaking um, intellectual centers. They were responsible for digesting these works. And I repeat, it's the British cultural studies, particularly Birmingham Institute of Cultural Studies, New Left Review. And in France, it was a think tank called Cadedim. So they also digested the works of uh, Frankfurt School for the regular audience, OK? So uh, some uh, current uh, proponents of the woke or CRT, of course, they might deny that they are Marxist. And they are right in this case. They will be right, OK? We are not Marxist. That's, that's, that's what they will tell you. And strictly speaking, I repeat, they're correct because they do not share ideas of, the leg of legacy Marxism, okay? But it doesn't mean that they do not share these uh, Marxian modes of thinking. For the past 20 years, and that's what my next slide addresses, among the Western left, one can see a fierce a factional struggle between the mainstream identity, race and gender Marxists, or cultural Marxists, or woke, you can call them, on the one side, and their marginalized comrades who still uh, prophesize uh, class, 
okay? <clears throat> Legacy Marxists. In this theological fight, each side uh, uh, tries to excommunicate each other for betraying the socialist creed, okay? Legacy Marxists uh, dismiss the opponents as bad Marxists. So the, the, here you can see one of the titles of this um, legacy Marxist books, the bad Marxism. So we don't like Frankfurt School. <laughs> we don't like this legacy, Mar uh, we don't like this cultural Marxist, okay? Because they betrayed the creed. One proud veteran of the Trotskyite movement <clears throat> even uh, bashed the malicious influence of the Frankfurt School. Okay, so we have this critique of the legacy Marxists on the part of the legacy Marxists, the critique of the Frankfurt School. The traditional left uh, are worried, and rightly so, I think, are worried that their identity-obsessed colleagues play a dangerous culture, blood, and race games. Uh, to be fair, I have to stress that statements of some woke activists uh, do remind to us... Uh, <clears throat> slogans about the socialism of the race. You could hear from uh, one uh, German politician in the interwar Europe okay, in 1930s. But of course, the cultural Marxists or woke left, they uh, cast aside their traditional legacy comrades and they said, oh, you are sectarians, you are dinosaurs, you belong to the old times, so you need to subscribe to this race and gender Marxism. Um, the most recent intellectual battle between uh, traditional Marxists and their woke op opponents concerns so-called uh, Project 1619, an ambitious attempt on the part of the mainstream cultural left to revisit the entire American history. Um, from, uh, it was an attempt, as you remember, to revisit the entire American history from the viewpoint of the original scene of slavery. And the argument was made by the cultural Marxists that uh, the major goal of American Revolution um, was to uh, <laughs> preserve slavery in North America. Okay? That aroused the indignation of legacy Marxists who started to criticize it. But the way they criticized cultural Marxists was that they said, oh, American Revolution was a bourgeois revolution that uh, was to open doors to the socialist revolution sometime in future. So basically, the uh, argument, which was heavily publicized in the mainstream media, Chronicle of Higher Education on YouTube, this um, uh, debate between legacy Marxists and cultural Marxists about uh, 1619. So the argument was about what was the um, mm, uh, centrality of class or race in the revolution of 1776, which was bizarre because it never dawned on the participants of that widely publicized ideological debate that the American Revolution represented the interplay of group, class, regional, religious, and individual interests, which could not be reduced to this abstract of class or race. And by the way, the intersectional theory, which uh, everybody heard a lot, represents attempt to find a way out of this conundrum, okay? Intersectionality writers uh, try to meld the big categories, <clears throat> big categories of uh, um, racial and ethnic power, which cultural Marxists created for themselves uh, by uh, 2010s, okay? The whites, Asians, Hispanics, Native Americans, blacks, and women on the side. So intersectionality tries to debunk this Okay, what they argue, they argue that our world is a bunch of uh, smaller groups, okay? We have to break apart these groups. So there are, uh, within these groups, there are people who exploit others more than the others. If you are a black woman, you're exploited more than a black man, okay? If you're Native Americans, um, you might be exploited maybe less than the black people. So they try to build up this hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of oppression, who is more victimized, who is uh, less victimized. So they built up these pyramids, or in this case, the wheel, the wheel of power, privilege, okay? Um, uh, it's uh, it's mind-boggling, of course, what, 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 what's going on, yeah. Recently, I found uh, the most exotic example of this uh, intersectional Marxism approach in an attempt to single out uh, the so-called blue people of Eastern Kentucky 
in the, uh, an oppressed minority. I'm not kidding. I'm not uh, making this up. Uh, I'm not joking. You can Google it. Blue people of Kentucky, you know, if you have phones right now. Um, historically, indeed, the, the, there has been a tiny community of people in that area who had extremely pale bluish skin. But in her recent novel, popular novel, um, called The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek, 2020, by one Kim Michelle Richardson, in this novel we see an attempt to play this oppression narrative because the writer created a story about the sad fate of a girl from Kentucky who was discriminated against by surrounding society based on her bluish skin. The book about the blue girl received stellar reviews. One of the reviewers, in fact, issued a direct recommendation. And you can see it here, yeah, I quote, add blue to our spectrum of prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, if you go this way, if you go, if you take this notion, intersectionality notion to the extreme, you will see that every one of us is a victim of something, yeah? And each one of us could be oppressed, okay? So logically, you have to come to a, a conclusion that ultimate minority is a human individual. <laughs> you have to embrace what? Methodological individualism. But logically speaking, but logic is, that's what is missing on the other side of the political spectrum, okay? <clears throat> so I suspect that uh, intersectionality as a way to find the ideological escape might be buried under its own weight, you know, might go down because we see these logical contradictions. So uh, the fact that the left for the past 10 years resorted to cancel culture is a sign of desperation, I think. Because some leftists who still have the uh, sparks of logic in their minds, they do revolt against this uh, craze that is going on in the socialist thought collective, okay? Uh, but the problem is that uh, right now they are the mainstream, okay? They call the shots. That is why we have this cancel culture. In old times prior to 1960s, it was right and conservatives who tried to police morality. Now it's the left mainstream that in a puritanical mode seeks to police everybody to find these big or small groups who are oppressed. Okay, tables were turned. Now it's the left and liberals who are the mainstream. Okay. Um, finally, uh, yesterday when we heard the uh, talk, which I enjoyed very much, uh, delivered by Paul, a question question was raised, what shall we do about this? One may wonder what can be done about all this. I think it's essential to show to students, and not necess necessarily to students, but to everybody else, that the left are not progressives. They are not countercultural, but they are true reactionaries because they are the mainstream. Not only they are the mainstream, but they try to impose these mainstream views on the rest of society. Um, and again, it, sh it shouldn't surprise us, there are some leftists uh, who actually tried to revolt, some reasonable people who tried to revolt against this. For example, during this uh, BLM insanity in the 2020 in summer, there was a group of leftists who wrote a letter to Harper's Magazine, 100 the left and liberal people, protesting against this expansion of um, cancel culture, okay? And I also think uh, we need to um, concentrate, to focus on internal squabbles among the left, because uh, pedagogically speaking, it might be a good strategy on our part to show this uh, insanity of the views they try to preach to impose on us, okay? So it's a good pedagogical strategy, for example, to tell students and other people about how they fight among each other, class or race, race or class, okay? Um, of course, uh, it works on those students who can think logically, who can think logically. But not everybody is ready to think logically, right? We know about this. So there is another effective way to deal with this uh, cultural left insanity or with woke people. It's uh, old weapon that had been used by dissidents in the good old Soviet Union and other European countries. It's uh, humor and laughter. 
humor and laughter. So if you read memoirs of Soviet dissidents, you notice that they ridiculed and uh, made fun, made fun of the regime and its uh, politically correct sacred cows in everyday life, uh, at work, at colleges. So the total fun of the sacred cows of the regime. And eventually, it helped to topple down the entire matrix of the socialist regime, for instance, in the Soviet Union, in other Eastern European countries. Um, the late, and I would like to finish my talk with the quote of the late British journalist, Malcolm Muggeridge, who was one of the first, by the way, to expose the horrors of Stalinist collectivization. He advised dissenters to use humor as the most potent weapon. In his essay, in his essay, America Needs a Punch, that was published in 1958, he wrote, laughter is the most effective of all subversive conspiracies, and it operates on our side, unquote. Thank you for your attention. And of course, if you have uh, questions, comments, critique, so please. We only have three minutes. Yes. Oh, three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I didn't give you time, you know, <laughs> because I tried to take advantage of this opportunity. Okay, huh? <laughs> okay go ahead. So after watching socialism fail again and again in the modern world and learning it in history, why do you think this generation in America is the most economically socialist generation this world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Because socialism, by its own nature, has this powerful emotional appeal, OK? It doesn't, uh, uh, especially today, it doesn't appeal to reason, to logic. It plays on your emotions, OK? It's the uh, most powerful weapon, OK? So that is why we have to fight back with emotions. So we have to use not only logic, as I said, we have to use all kinds of emotional weapons. You know, if you, for instance, go to Walmart or somewhere like uh, have a casual conversation with people, you know, try to crack a joke, <laughs> as I said, this, uh, try to use any kind of devices, you know, somewhere logics in some uh, place, your logic might work in other places, the humor might work. But the, the general explanation is that we have to go through this stage. And I read statistics that it's, I forgot how they call this youngest generation, Z or Z. They're already less socialistic. The kids that are 14, 15, you know, it's, uh, I read statistics. That it's uh, people who are really uh, heavily loaded with socialism. It's uh, what it is, millennials, right? Millennials. Millennials, millennials yeah. The people of uh, like in their 30s, 40s. Um, the problem is that in colleges, in uh, major news outlets, uh, uh, they created these hubs, the pockets of the left, the pockets of socialism, if you wish, you know, because these graduate schools, for instance, they prepared their own uh, students, the students became professors, they taught the other people, and eventually you have this intellectual bubble, okay? In order for this bubble to be cracked, I think uh, uh, we have to go through this stage. You know, it's a in many respects, it's a generational thing. It's, I don't buy the stuff about that young people always tend to be socialists and uh, old folks tend to be conservatives. I think somehow it's related to uh, millennials. They are children of those who had been educated by the new left, by these, how they called, um, baby boomers. They were educated by ba baby boomers. The baby boomers created millennials, and when millennials will die out like dinosaurs, we will have, hopefully, the new generation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>